Greetings to all. In this gripping episode, we will delve into the depths of history, tracing the roots of India's naval heritage and sail through the waves of time to witness the monumental growth, modernization and strategic expansion of the Indian Navy. From the iconic INS Vikrant to indigenously developed vessels, our journey will unravel the multifaceted dimensions of the Indian Navy's evolution. So, mark your calendar for 15th August as we set sail on this enlightening odyssey celebrating the 360 development of the Indian Navy with Swaroop Anand and Commodore Dr. Shrikant Kesnoor. Hi, um welcome to Maritime Conversations. Uh the Indian Navy was presented the President's Color. Uh it was the first service to be presented uh with the President's Color. Vice Admiral uh, Manohar Awati whom we have uh, spoken about in the past was the person who actually received it from the president uh, babu rajendra, rajendra prasad. prasad um you know let's take this opportunity um, you know to talk about the growth and development of the navy over the last 70 odd years uh, i am sitting with uh, commodore uh, shrikant kesnoor uh, welcome commodore um so yeah i think a great way to kind of start uh, you know the growth and development of the navy uh starting as the you know of course the bombay marine the royal indian marine the royal indian navy and then the indian navy um you know the 70 odd years uh, of the navy let's talk about that yeah uh, i'm so glad you mentioned about the uh, uh presentation of the president's color because right. the navy was the first service and in many ways that that sort of frames mm. uh, the navy's uh, let's say uh, achievement or the start point you can say the uh, erstwhile the, senior service the erstwhile senior service <laughs> absolutely and while it's not the senior service in in uh, after independence yeah um, certainly the presentation of the president's color marks one point mm. or one part of the spectrum so to say yeah and today uh, 23 2023 marks the second end of the spectrum mm. and if you are looking at 70 years or say 75 years of independence then you got a good measure of how the navy has sort of grown mm. and um, you know i am glad that you brought out the all the past yeah. incarnations of the navy so to speak right. but interestingly its immediate past predecessor was the royal indian navy yeah. uh, which came to force on the 2nd of october 1934 that's right uh and dissolved uh, i mean it ceased to be the royal indian navy on 26 jan 1950 right though it became a republic yeah though virtually after independence it was uh, indian you know in 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 thought action it just carried that royal indian uh, um, until we became a republic so this journey from 34 to 47 or 50 uh, is an interesting one mm. uh, it's an interesting one for several reasons because it was a small service mm. that expanded hugely during the war right uh, it saw war mm-hmm. and it performed very well mm. in various theaters of war right despite its extremely limited resources mm. most importantly it was a fantastic training ground for the future leadership of indian navy right so almost all who were the leaders of indian navy in the first couple of decades right were those who had seen action in world war 2 that's right and remember that's that's a fantastic training ground yeah then immediately after the war you had the naval uprising mm. uh, you know in hms talwar what was called the mutiny the yeah. uprising Uh, so that also taught certain lessons you know oh. this was in the cocktail of circumstances political uh, independence movement lots of things happening right so the uprising which now today has a pride of place is one of the events that led to the exit of british uh, was another important event and then you had the independence and partition uh, and the navy being divided so to say right uh, a small navy being truncated further that's right and then you had 1950 by 1950 we had acquired the hms delhi delhi yeah. which became ins delhi our mm. first capital ship and that's important because it showed sign of intent mm. it talked about a navy that was now being ambitious right it was going to go from sloops of 1000 tons right to cruisers of 7 8000 tons you know mm. that was a leap of imagination right so in many ways uh, these 70 years i mean um, uh, i tend to 
sort of go back and front. There's so much to talk. Right. But these 70, 75 years is a remarkable journey for two or three reasons. Mm. One is as the smallest survey is further truncated uh, by partition, by the fact that lots of facilities, training facilities were in Karachi. That's right. And by the fact that the Indian Navy was deliberately kept uh, in a, as a small force mm. because the Britishers were very clear that all the blue water tasks will be taken by them. By the and, Navy. And, and the RIN is only meant for coastal defense. Yeah. For that kind of a service today to rise, mm. to become one of the uh, four or five largest navies in the world, right. uh, to become a three-dimensional navy, mm. to become a navy that's capable of naval aviation, Yep. And formidable record right. that operates aircraft carriers, that operates submarines, that has a formidable, uh, you know, surface force. Yeah. And that has niche strengths in a lot of areas from hydrography to diving to Marcos uh, to band. Mm. Um, and above all, I think the Navy's biggest achievement has been in the area of self-sufficiency and self-reliance, right. Atmanir Bharata, building in India. Mm -hmm. And I would say all of this has been reflected in the way we have performed, mm -hmm. uh, whether in war, uh, in operational and combat missions, and in diplomatic and HADR missions. Right. So there's a wide canvas, right. and I, I leave it to you to ask me no, so, uh, questions accordingly. Yeah, no, so I think the last point, right, uh, diplomacy. Um, you've been our defense attache uh, in Africa. You are based out of uh, Nairobi, our embassy in Nairobi. And of course, you were, um, you know, pretty much uh, four different countries in Africa. I, I was a defense advisor to three countries formally, right. uh, to, to Kenya, to Tanzania and to Seychelles. Right. But since my um, high commissioner also overlooked um, uh, Eritrea and Somalia, right. uh, I Iran, became collaterally for that. Yeah. And then there were a lot of countries that were not formally covered. Uh, and when, when the Navy needed some sort of uh, interaction or some communication, sure. uh, I, I would go there. Uh, for example, uh, interestingly, when the naval ships, uh, Indian Navy ships visited Reunion. Yeah. Now, though Reunion is French territory, mm. uh, rather than have the RDA in France come from Paris, uh, I was directed to look after the arrangements of right. visit. So, uh, I mean, I had a very interesting yeah. time in East Africa. So, since you've been RDA, um, you know, I think we'll start with diplomacy. Uh, you know, let's unpack that a little bit. Um, the Indian Navy and diplomacy you know, what are the different things? I, you see, uh, fundamentally one has to understand and, and without prejudice to the other two services, uh, because the navies operate in international waters all mm. the time, mm. uh, they are a natural fit for diplomacy. Uh, and because the sea is a multilateral medium, mm. uh, navies are very good at multilateral sort of, uh, you can say, interactions and negotiations. And, and the the cosmopolitanism that comes out of sea, out mm. of being at sea, uh, lends itself naturally to the naval profession. Right. So I think all of this makes things. And ships carry a range of organic strengths, you know, technical strengths, helicopters, boats, uh, engineering strengths. And all of these can be brought to bear in a very benign way mm. uh, in different conditions at different places. So there are lots of things that make navies very good at uh, diplomacy. Mm -hmm. But to translate that theory into practice and action, you need a professional navy, right. you need a good navy, you need a navy with long sea legs. Mm. After all, you need ships that can go that distance, cover sure. that distance and go across to different parts of the world. Mm. So again, I think our founding fathers did fantastically well mm. in wanting to have big ships right from inception. Mm. So the Delhi and Mysore did their fair share of showing our flag around the world yeah, as it was called the flag. Uh, and that has been taken in a far more systemic and institutional manner by the navy uh, over the years and particularly again in the last 20 25 years mm. we have established specific institutional mechanisms in naval headquarters mm. uh, you know with directorates for this we've had big events like the international fleet review like the Goa Maritime Conclave, like the Milan series, you know, yeah. where we have invited lots of foreign navies. Mm. We were one of the pioneer nations that started the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. Right. So this coming together of the navies uh, to do 
to attend to the common maritime challenges in the world is what maritime diplomacy seeks to do. Right. And I think by being a big navy and by being what uh, how the navy presents itself mm. as being the preferred security partner mm -hmm. for common security problems yeah. and as the first responder in case of humanitarian yeah. uh, disaster requirements uh, in the Indian Ocean region, I think the navy is placed uh, to handle a lot of maritime diplomacy missions and it has a professional navy and big ships that are capable of doing. Uh, I mean unpacking this can again take <laughs> huge amount yeah, uh, from equipment strength to capacity building to capability enhancement sure. to joint exercises. Mm -hmm. uh, but suffice it to say that um, this has been in vogue right from independence mm. but has got renewed impetus in the last couple of uh, decades. And uh, the fact that now the foreign policy establishment takes note of this much yeah, more, yeah. Uh, that the Indian Navy ships uh, are considered to be a part of our, um, let's say, diplomatic bouquet of options right. for the practice of diplomacy. I think that's a big thing. Right, right. You know, I think we are, uh, uh, you know, just on the heels of Operation Kaveri, um, you know, unfortunate, uh, you know, situation in Sudan. Um, you know, our ships, uh, of course, our, uh, you know, our aircraft from the Indian Air Force, we have our, um, you know, embassy staff, the attache, all of them in, of you know, in the middle of Kaveri. Uh, we want to, you know, talk a little bit about Indian Navy's role there. Yes, of course. I mean, in the sense that I think the Indian Navy put in uh, two or three ships mm. and uh, they were moved from Sudan to uh, uh, Saudi, yeah. where, where, from where they were then airlifted subsequently. Uh, frequently what happens, whether it is uh, uh, in Sudan or earlier happened in Yemen right. and in, yeah. um, uh, in Obrahat and in Lebanon, you know, uh, Libya a little bit is that frequently Indians in different parts of the world need to be evacuated right. and often the airports are out of action mm. because of the civil war or hostile elements right. and then the seaport becomes the most natural way of in this case of course certain other airports were activated mm. and evacuation happened both by sea and through land which is good sure. uh, but often it can happen only through like in Rahat that happened only by sea. Right. So I think the Navy provides a very attractive option. Mm. Now uh, the individual cases apart, what is necessary is the Navy is actually sending a reassurance to Indian diaspora all over the world mm. that look, you know, uh, India as a whole is sending, uh, not Indian Navy, India as a whole is sending a message that of reassurance to Indian diaspora, to Indian expatriate to say that look, if you are in trouble, we'll get you out. We'll get you out. Yeah. And I think the Indian Navy plays a big role there. Yeah, yeah. Also, there are lots of soft skills, you know, when you see a Navy sailor lift a baby, yeah, yeah. escort an old person yeah. or something. Lovely uh, images. You know, lovely out. images. Yeah. So, you have to teach these soft skills. You have to, and, and you have to make lots of accommodation arrangements. On a, oh. a, a ship is always a tight fit yeah, yeah. to be able to do that, to get medical aid, to get food. You know, sailors often leave their own bunks and, yeah. and all of this has to be done while keeping the operational profile of the ship intact. Yeah, because you are still under threat. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And you not only, you can't let anyone be harmed, you, you also don't want any of your crew to be harmed. Right. So that's why I think these are, these are far more complex and far more, let's say, uh, um, if not dangerous, far more challenging missions mm. than what comes out frequently right. and evacuation situations, uh, though they go by the nomenclature of non-combatant evacuations, mm. they can often be far more messy mm. than, than we bargain for. Right. So I think the uh, armed forces are trained for this yeah. and I think the Navy presents a very good option. Right, right, right. Um, you know, you know, the forge come rain or shine, the forge is always there to kind of help, uh, you know, it's awam, right, it's, it's, it's people. Um, so let's talk about the HADR, uh, you know, operations, missions, uh, you know, that the Navy uh, has done. Uh, you know, you've been, you've commanded our hippo, you know, and it's Jalashwa, um, which participated, of course, in um, uh, Operation Samudra Setu uh, yes. yeah. 2, I think. Um, both one and two. Both one and two. So uh, a little bit about HADR missions, I think. Uh, are they more, uh, you know, complex, uh, you know, what are the different other different elements that kind of come into play when, you know, 
the navy is essentially um, executing these uh, hadr missions see uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief again mm. uh, enshrined duty of anyone in uniform mm. uh, but between the desire and the delivery <laughs> there is a gap right and fulfilling that gap requires a navy to be big capable and professional right this is not new in 1949 the old uh, ins delhi hmm. went and carried out a hdr mission in trincomalee right uh, in the uh, then the british base at that time got kudos for that right so it's been there if you see the naval history book you will find that naval ships have always gone out hmm. you know and and rendered assistance at various times within the country and uh, in the neighborhood right however again it it got of some sort of a huge recognition in the aftermath of the tsunami mm. of 2004 mm. when the navy went out in a big way uh, i think within 36 hours of the incident even though india and indian ports were affected uh, we were i think able to send out almost 10000 tons of relief about 30 40 ships and we not only rendered assistance within India, mm. we also did that in the neighborhood, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Maldives. Right, right. And that is when I think um, uh, the realization came in naval authorities that look, this, this is going to be uh, something for which we need to create some sort of dedicated infrastructure, mm. but dual use always, you can't, you can't. <laughs> which is how uh, Jalashwa, the amphibian, the, the hippo came in. Right. Uh, amphibious ships are uniquely uh, suited for disaster, humanitarian assistance and disaster missions, though they are by no means the only ones. Right. Often navies have to make do with those you have, like Rahat didn't have any amphibious ships. Um, I don't think the Kaveri has any, but Samudra Setu had. Yes. So Samudra Setu 1 and 2, which involved evacuation of almost 4,000 uh, Indians in Samudra Setu 1. Yeah. Mission Sagar, which was distribution of medicines. Right. And then you had Samudra Setu 2, the Oxygen Express. Right. I think that was mostly done by the amphibious ships. Mm. And that was brilliantly done. Right. I mean, to do Samudra Setu 1 evacuation when you had the Galvan crisis, mm. uh, when you had COVID, and uh, when you, you had to make sure that nobody in the ship was affected, you had to make sure that the combat edge of the ships didn't ha get diluted in any way and you had to bring back people. So, so I, I thought that was, that was uh, wonderful. Mm. And during my tenure, of course, we were, uh, we were prepared for two for filing this, that had stuck in Southeast Asia. Right. We were prepared and put on alert, but ultimately we didn't go. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, uh, you know, it tells us how, how uh, uh, amphibious ships very uniquely suited for right. humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Right. Uh, there's one small story and I've always been fascinated by these side stories. That's I understand right. that one of the girl, uh, one of the evacuees from uh, on Jalashwa mm. delivered a child, I think a girl, oh. and uh, just before they reached Kochi or just after they reached. Mm -hmm. And I always felt that, uh, I don't know, uh, but I always feel that the parent should have named that girl as Jalashwa <laughs> <laughs> after the ship. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, right. I mean, the reason doctor of any, uh, you know, combatant force is, uh, is, is war, uh, you know. Uh, let's talk about the operations uh, of the Navy. I mean, uh, 1971, of course, was when the Navy came into its element, possibly the, uh, you know, the best moment in its uh, then young history. Uh, but of course, before that, after that, there are multiple moments of uh, great achievement. Let's unpack that. Yes, um, uh, you know, uh the Navy is called the silent service Yeah. Uh, because, um, you know, you can't follow what happens beyond the horizon where Navy is operate. Yeah. So not many people have an idea of what the Navy has done. Mm -hmm. And often because Navy's role is also to keep the war below a certain threshold. Right. So that too is not probably understood by many. Mm. Uh, so you see, uh, Navy was involved right after independence in the accession of Junagadh mm. in what was called our first tri-service operation, Operation Peace. Right. Now, the important thing about Junagadh, as, as uh, Navy historian Satinder Singh says, mm. that after maybe four or five centuries or whatever or more, for the first time, the Navy was operating as a representative of the 
elected government of India mm. as the sovereign government of right, India. Right, right. So that I think was a very important thing. In, in, in terms of operation, it might have just been a coercive one, not big. Sure. But the fact that the Navy was mobilized and sent for that. Mm-hmm. Then 1961 liberation of Goa, the yeah. Navy plays a crucial role uh, in, in, in what happened in uh, the island of Anjadeep, where we lost people mm-hmm. and m- very unfortunate, but that is how you sort of grow and learn. Then you had the action in Goa Harbour where uh, F1 Soil Booker was, was sort of uh, destroyed and had to surrender. Uh, the, because the, the lovely signal, from signal. Uh, capture me a Portuguese frigate, <laughs> please. please. Yes. Uh, I mean, not, not a great ask. Yeah, not a great <laughs> ask. He ends it with please. Yeah, please. <laughs> and, and the man, uh, you know, commanding um, uh, Betua. Rusi Gandhi. Uh, Rusi Gandhi rose yeah. to the occasion. occasion. And he, and he did uh, capture yeah. Albuquerque yeah. for his ah. chief. Absolutely. Rusi, a great, great uh, this one. Similarly, um, uh, Captain Nilkan uh, Krishnan, yeah. he does great action in Diu. Right. Uh, he's asked to stay 10 miles away, but he closes, <laughs> says to hell with it when on the army is in danger on board Delhi, blasts the Diu fort and, right. and the surrender flag goes up in 15 minutes. So, the Navy played a key role and the aircraft carrier had also come in. Yep. So, it sort of did a silent role of guarding from the seas and ensuring the old that there was no the INS Vikram, the old one. Mm-hmm. So, again, these were important lessons for us. Mm. Uh, 65, we had to play a largely defensive role. Yeah. We were told by the political um, uh, authorities not to cross the latitude of Porbandar, whatever the reason. So, it was a defensive sort of um, assigned role which it carried out, the Navy carried out well. But perhaps there was some, some sense of disquiet about the mm. way we were utilized in 65. Yeah, yeah. So in 71 when the opportunity came, I think we delivered yeah. and that was the Navy's finest and hour. How? <laughs> and how? Yeah. And I think we should do a separate uh, you know, episode on the Navy in the so 71 multiple war. Episodes. Multiple you know, episodes. The Western Theatre, the Eastern, Eastern Theatre. Theater, Theater, Operation uh, the X, N- yeah. X, the Commando Operations. Aircraft carrier operations, the attack on Karachi, all of that. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. Uh, then, but after 71 2, uh, there have been other operations. 87 to 90, we were involved in Sri Lanka yeah. uh, in the peace support operation of Pavan. Pavan. And then you had the operation Cactus in Maldives, yeah. again, a tri service operation. Then in Somalia, we had Operation Bolster and Shield mm. when the Navy went along with the army, you know, it was another sort of operation. Yeah. So, not many people know of this. Right. You know, for example, Pavan was followed by three years of Operation Tasha, right. which is a sort of policing peace support operation of Sri uh, Lanka. Mm-hmm. Then you had Operation Swan after the bomb blasts in Bombay That's right. for uh, policing the West Coast. Mm. Then after, Kar- during Kargil, the Navy was mobilized in a big way. I've written about this mm-hmm. and how that sort of, you know, kept uh, the war below a certain threshold right. and Navy was used in different ways. Similarly, in Operation Parakram, yeah. the Navy was mobilized and again, international media reports and a lot of it attests that it was because the Indian Navy was mobilized hmm. that Pakistan sort of, you know, went two steps back and, and sort of there was an early resolution to the conflict, so to say. Hmm. In more recent times, Galwan, Balakot, Uri, all of these times, I think the Navy has been mobilized. It has played its role in the high seas. Uh, a lot of it is sort of political and combat signaling, all of which is not necessarily understood or at that time played up. But um, uh, the people must know mm. that the Navy has been active uh, and up and about in all the security situations involving the country over the last two decades or more. Yeah, and we can't be more thankful uh, to our Navy for that. Super. I think uh, lots to unpack. Each of the points that uh, Commodore Kesnu talked about can be uh, an episode in its you know, own right. Um, and these are basically going to be our future episodes as well. Uh, so thank you for joining.